Thank you, worship team. Appreciate that. Well, we're in our Bibles. We're in 1 John chapter number 2, verses 18 through 23. Pastor Mike read just a couple of those verses for us, and we'll be getting into the rest of this portion as well here in just a few minutes. I do want to start out with just reminding you of a couple important prayer requests. Uh, one, obviously, uh, the folks that are in Ukraine and the ongoing uh, war that's going on there, just that God would intervene. And uh, we know God can do miracles, and uh, it would be great to see Him stop this and try to help these dear folks uh, get out of this type of um, uh, crazy situation that they're in. Secondly, um, we had a sweet family in our church this week, had an accident at home, uh, little Ronnie uh, and her mom Mary, uh, she got uh, her hair caught on fire with a candle, uh, the mom, of course, coming to rescue also was burnt, so they took her to the hospital, so little Ronnie has second degree burns on her head and face and neck, and, and mom has burns as well, but they're, they're doing well, but if you would pray uh, for a quick healing, and, uh, and so that would be a, a no, no doubt a blessing to them. They're watching from home, so uh, let them know uh, if you can that you're praying for them. Uh, then thirdly, uh, John and Lisa Vigilante, we've been praying for them, helping them out. John, as you know, had a heart attack seven months ago now, and uh, then had oxygen deprivation. He's been in the hospital ever since. Uh, he's slowly showing some improvements, but nothing uh, that would yet show that he'll be able to function on his own. But uh, just to give you an indication, he was able to actually eat uh, some food, which is a huge step because he was on a tube for a long time, but then also he was able to comb his hair. Uh, and so that's a big step, whether you understand that or not. But I would ask you to continue to pray for the vigilante uh, family. Many of you have been helping just by donations. Uh, I would say please continue that. We're helping and trying to figure out a lot of things for bill pay for them, and it's been a, a very difficult time for this dear family. So pray for uh, John and Lisa and the kids still. Uh, then uh, we had a family that used to attend this church many years ago, a military family, and sadly their 18-year-old son passed away this week. And just prayers for the family. It's just a very difficult and grievous time for them. A wonderful Christian family, but just you can imagine a, a hard time to lose a son at that age. So uh, those are things I just want to bring to your attention. We're a church family. We, we try to help in each other's needs and pray for each other's needs. And uh, a note of encouragement, or even if you can do something to help out in some way, I'm sure that would be appreciated. But if you wouldn't mind, let's, let's start with another word of prayer and ask God on, on behalf of these things. And I know there's many other things that we could think about, but I just felt like we should bring these to you this morning. So let's pray together. Father, as we come to you, I thank you once again for a community of believers that does believe in prayer. Uh, not only are we commanded to pray, but we have the privilege and the blessing of coming before our God uh, for grace to help in the time of need. And Lord, no doubt many of us have bills and we have health issues and trials and other things, but Lord, I felt impressed to bring these before our, our folks as some are aware of these situations, others may not, but to have more people praying uh, would only be, I'm sure, an encouragement and a help. So we bring before you the people of Ukraine, many of whom we'll never meet, but uh, the loss of life and just the, the catastrophic damage to that country that is not stopping at this point, we ask that you would intervene for the many missionaries and, and Christians that are there that are trying to minister to others, that you would please sustain them as well. For the country of Russia and uh, Vladimir Putin, that, Lord, you would bring a stop to this, that you would change his mind, that you would cause this to uh, be over. And uh, we ask that you would please uh, intervene on behalf of those dear folks. We do pray for Mary and Ronnie, and of course, Lord, just for Ronnie with the more severe uh, injuries, that you would please heal her quickly. And uh, may you please uh, encourage them and help them uh, during this time of healing. We ask for the vigilante family, Lord, just a precious family, but obviously going through a life-changing uh, health crisis, and uh, financially and, and housing-wise every way, uh, it's been a change for Lisa and the boys, and I just ask you to please help us to get the answers and get the help that we need to get them resettled, and that you would please work out the details, and that uh, you would just guide uh, all that are a part of this team trying to help them out. And then for this other family, I won't mention their name, that are just going through a very difficult time with the loss of their son. Would you please heal uh, the heartache and, and the wounds there and that you would please comfort them and that you would have many, as I know already are, coming alongside of them. But Lord, in those quiet moments, it's hard to know what we would think personally when we go through such uh, heartache. And I ask that you would sustain them during this time and, and just be comforted by your grace. So Lord, we ask now as we turn a direction toward your word, 
that you would please strengthen us as believers, that you would increase our faith as we study, and we ask that you would please uh, help people that may be listening at home or here that have not put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ to clearly sense your presence and your spirits, uh, your spirit talking to them today. And then, Lord, for those of us who are believers, that you would just strengthen our resolve to live for you in light of what this text says. So we ask that you would please guide us now into your truth. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Well, as I mentioned, we're in 1 John chapter number uh, 2, and uh, we'll uh, begin here in verse number 18 in just a moment, but uh, the title of the message is Sign of the Last Times, Sign of the Last Times, because this is uh, what the text is talking about. And uh, John, as we have been uh, wa- going through this series on walking the light in 1 John, uh, we see that he is giving different tests to believers to help them to verify whether or not they are in the faith or not in the faith. And so here's another one of those tests is, uh, will you walk away? And uh, will you be persuaded by those who are against Christ and follow after false teaching? And so this is another one of those tests that as we look here uh, to verify yourself, uh, do you really truly believe Jesus is your Lord and Savior and, uh, and that you are walking with Him? And so when we hear the idea or the, the words, the last times or end times, uh, that conjures up a lot of thoughts. For some people, it's fearful. Uh, that scares them when they hear about the end times coming. Uh, For others, it uh, creates uh, anxiety of different kinds. And for some, it's a question that has a bunch of rabbit holes and you just feel like you're spinning out of control and chasing a whole bunch of uh, ideas. And so, well, John does a good job of just limiting it to a particular uh, understanding. And I think that'll be helpful to us today, uh, looking at this particular text and helping out. But the last times, to kind of set the tone here, and we'll get into some verses in a moment, just to kind of set the tone. In general, it's speaking about the time that Jesus Christ came to this earth and started His earthly ministry until the time of the rapture, beginning then the tribulation. If you're not familiar with those terms, uh, each one is a message in itself, and so you're going to have to just trust me on this. We are living in this church age time, period. And, uh, and during this church day time period, it's a, it's a time that started with Jesus, uh, earthly ministry, and uh, we are now living during this time. And so this is considered the last times. You say, well, how long are the last times? We don't know. <laughs> right now, it's been a little over 2,000 years. And so, uh, but everything is pointing to the fact that it is speeding up and things are getting worse and worse. Uh, you think about it, in 2022, that we have a major world po- power bombing the, 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 uh, the country right next to them. Uh, in this day and age, if, if we truly do think about man rising to another level, how in the world are we here at this point just bombing people and killing people relentlessly uh, because they want more territory? It just doesn't make sense. And so we, we understand that the Bible tells us there'll be wars and rumors of wars. There'll be more and more calamities that will take place, and we can get into the natural disasters before he returns. And so uh, to break it down today, John is just talking about specifically the idea of antichrists, plural, but he does mention the antichrist as well. So I'm going to define those for you so it'll help you a little bit without going into a deep study on it today, because really what he's talking about here is, is one of the tests of a believer. Will you walk away or will you stay faithful? And that's what he's in reference to. Will you be led astray by a false teacher Or will you stay faithful to Jesus Christ throughout the time He's given you here on this earth? So number one, I want you to notice in our text a distinct warning. John gives a very distinct warning here in verse number 18. And it reads in 1 John chapter 2, verse number 18. And and John, as we've seen him, you'll continue to see him. He uses his enduring term, little children. It is the last time. And as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come. So there, singular, that Antichrist shall come shall come, even now there are many antichrists, plural, whereby we know that it is the what? Last time. So John is saying, hey, because there are many antichrists, it is the last time. So somewhere John in his teaching from Jesus, and no doubt uh, hearing from Paul and Peter, he has this idea that the last times have something to do with many antichrists, but there's going to come a time when the Antichrist, the Antichrist, also will show up. So we have two different things there we have to define so you understand why John is saying this. And so the first thing I want you to notice, though, is he makes a very clear declaration that this last time or last hour 
is a reference. Turn with me, if you, you can, to, if you will, to Gen- or Gal- Genesis. Galatians chapter 1 and verse number 4. Galatians chapter 1, verse number 4. And then I'm going to have to go to stay in the same book and go to chapter 4 and verse 4. So Galatians chapter 1, verse number 4. We notice what it says here, the Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians, and John would have been privy to Paul's writings, and no doubt the Apostle Paul himself is one of the uh, apostles, uh, or, or as, as one who is, uh, John came before Paul, but yet he's outliving Paul in his life. Galatians chapter 1, verse 4, who gave himself for our sins, talking about Jesus, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. And so when he talks about this idea of this present evil world, the, the other term there for world is age. He's talking about this age. The Apostle Paul is saying this present evil age. So he gives it a specific time. And, uh, and so we consider this time, our age. He calls this an evil age, an evil world. This is important because this is backed up in the Scripture that Right now, God is allowing Satan to work his evil in this world with restraints, but it is during this time. And so he calls it this present evil age or this present evil world. Turn to Galatians chapter 4 and verse number 4. Galatians chapter 4, verse number 4. Another reference to this time. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son made of a woman, made under law, to redeem them that were under law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. All right, back in verse number four there, he says there was a specific time that God sent forth his son. Well, who's his son? Jesus Christ. Well, what time did Jesus get here? Well, the New Testament time period, as we look back, about 2,000 years ago. So that was a reference to time that that, uh, all the writers will start indicating seems to be the end times or the last time, this end age. So this is a, another reference to that. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. We're going to do a lot more turning today, so bear with me, or just jot down the notes and go back and study them yourself. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 11. Now all these things, and what he's making reference to, he's making reference to things that were written before um, and um, talking about some of the Old Testament uh, signs and whatnot. In verse number 11 now, he picks up, Now all these things happened unto them for examples, that they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. And so the idea then is that the Apostle Paul is writing, saying, Hey, the reason that these are written, that we're copying these and giving you these illustrations, because they're written for your example, because of the end of the age that is going to come. And so he's making reference that you need to understand why these things were done. It was for your example, so you would understand what day and age you're living in right now. All right, go to Hebrews chapter number 9. And uh, earlier I I wrote down the wrong text. I I said Hebrews 9, 6. It's actually 9, 26 in the first service. They didn't get this verse because I I messed up on my writing it down the wrong verse. But Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26 through 28, here we have another reference to a, a particular time. So again, all this going with John's distinct warning. In verse number 26 of Hebrews 9, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world, notice, in the end of the world hath appeared to put away sin, by the sacrifice of himself. Well, who is that in reference to? It's in reference to Jesus Christ. And he's made this reference at the end of the world, at the end of the age. So he's talking about time that Jesus was here. We have this reference to the beginning of the end of the age. Verse 27, just as an understanding of, of, of what else is to come. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. This is something that no man will escape. No human will escape. You will live on on this earth, God predetermines that time, but then that time will be up, and you will face judgment as a non-believer, and then you you will then face glory as a believer. Notice what he says here, verse 28. So Christ once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. There's a reference that Jesus Christ is going to come back a second time. The first time 
was here as a, as a, he was born as a baby, but then he had his earthly ministry. He sacrificed himself on the cross as God in the flesh to pay for our sin debt in its totality, resurrected from the dead. He proved he was God, and he is now there to intercede for you and I for our sins. And for anyone that wants to get saved, he's there as your God to say, yes, once you understand it and you call on him, you could also be saved from your sins. Now he's making reference to the second time, the next time he comes, it's going to be a blessing. Because he's going to take Christians and we're going to go up and we're going to meet him and it's going to be for a time of great rejoicing. And so we get to look forward to the next time he comes. Amen? Amen. You, if you're a Christian, this should excite you like, yes, the next time he's coming, we're going up to meet him in the air and then we get to be with him forever. And so it's a wonderful blessing that uh, we'll be able to be with him for eternity. So I share these with you because they give you kind of a reference point to this time, the end of the world, the end of the age, all these different terms that the writers use to kind of give you an a, a understanding of this is the last time that John is referencing here. One more reference in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 20 and 21, 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verse number 20 and 21, and it says, "...who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, talking about Jesus Christ, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. So again, another reference to the fact that this is the last time Jesus was presented during this last time. He laid his life down and this was now for your glory as well, that if you get saved, you'll be able to rejoice with him for eternity. So we see this distinct warning that we have the reference to this last hour or this last time or this end of age type of event that took place. So how do we know that uh, this is the last time? We'll go back to 1 John chapter number 2 and notice what it says in our verse again, verse number 18, 1 John chapter 2, verse number 18, little children, it is the last time and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. So he points you forward he said, someday the Antichrist will come. But now he makes a reference to this last time. How do we know it's the last time? Notice what he says secondly here in verse number 18. Even now there are many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. So according to John, how do we know it's the last time? Because there are many Antichrists here already on the earth. Now that was in John's time, but it's also in our time. It hasn't ended. So we have to define now, what does he mean by Antichrist? And, uh, and I think this is important because he mentions a singular one, and then he mentions also many. And so let's talk about this idea of an antichrist. Well, one understanding of antichrist, and the word anti means against, uh, but we have this idea of a false Christ. Matthew 24, verse number 5, Jesus had mentioned there that there'll be many that'll come in his name claiming they are Christ, meaning they are the Messiah. So many other than Jesus, who is the true one, There'll be many that'll come, they'll claim also that they are Jesus, that they are the Messiah. And so that has happened down through the centuries. There have been many different people that actually claim to be the Messiah, the one coming to save people from their sins. Absolutely not true, but that has happened. Now, were they the, the Antichrist? No, they were Antichrist. They were against Christ and, and they were false Christ, I should say. They were false Christ. And so the first meaning of, of Antichrist, because we have see both meanings used in our scriptures, was a place, a person instead of Christ, put in the, the place of Christ. Well, anytime someone puts themselves in the place of Christ, they're a false Christ. They're a false Messiah. They're a false Savior. It's not true. So that's one understanding of Antichrist. The second one is an adversary of Christ, someone who is literally against Christ. Now the question is, could I or you go against Christ? Yes. So you could actually be considered an Antichrist, not the Antichrist, but you could be considered as one who stands against Christ. And so that is something that he mentions here because he is saying there are many Antichrists even then in their midst. And this is what he was warning about. How are you going to know that you're a true believer? That you don't fall for their tricks, that you don't follow their deceptive teaching, that you do not, uh, you're not persuaded away by believing these lies. You stay faithful to God. That's how you'll know if you're a true believer. And so what are the characteristics of these antichrists? Well, they are adversaries of the true message of Jesus Christ. They're, they're opponents uh, to the gospel. It's an attitude or a way of thinking against the truth of who Jesus Christ truly is. And so 
these are individuals who reject the true gospel message and the true uh, deity of Jesus Christ, and they're working against that message. And so that's these many antichrists that uh, John is referencing here. That's who it's in reference to. But then I want you to notice, as we consider this, there will also be the Antichrist who will come. Now, before we get to that, Mark 13, 6 says, Many shall come in my name. These are Jesus' words saying that I am Christ, very similar to Matthew 24. So many will come in my name saying that they are, uh, that, they, that I am Christ and will deceive many. And so that's the other part of these Antichrists. They are working deception, trying to get you to uh, follow their lies questioning the deity of Jesus Christ, that He's truly God, that He really died on the cross for your sins, that He really truly was resurrected. Those, they'll try to sow discord. The way that happens today in many denominational religions is the fact that they'll teach the gospel like we do. Salvation by Jesus Christ alone through faith, right? You're saved by grace through faith. But you also have to do this in order to be sure that you're saved. You also have to be a member of our particular denomination or church in order for you to be sure you're saved. That's false teaching, folks. The Apostle Paul said it very clearly, who hath bewitched you to believe this lie of of anything adding to faith alone in Jesus Christ? And yet today there are many Christian denominations. Christian, that's the term. They're called Christians like we are, but they teach a false doctrine of salvation. They add to it. And, And Paul, if he was here today, he was saying they're bewitched. They're deceived. They're they're sowing discord. And so we must understand that Jesus himself was very uh, strict against the false teachers as well as the apostles. And we need to be. We need to call them out when we see them. And so this, the Antichrist that is mentioned here in in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, he says, as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, pointing to the future. Well, folks, just so you understand, based on Scripture, my best understanding of Scripture and many other theologians uh, that I would not call myself a theologian as much, but many other pastors and theologians would tell you, this has not happened yet. But there will come a time where this will happen. The Antichrist will appear on the scene. And so when will that take place? Well, just so you understand a a little bit of the scope of of the, we call it eschatology, uh, study of the end times. Right now we're living in the church age. Since Jesus Christ was here on this earth and established his church, we are, about, we are here called as Christians to do the work of Jesus Christ by spreading the message of the gospel and getting as many people into his church before he returns. Well, when's he going to return? Well, we don't know. But when he does return, he's not coming to earth. He's taking us up to heaven. And then it starts a seven-year tribulation period on, on this earth. The first three and a half years of that tribulation period They'll be trying to orchestrate and and align nations and government. And guess who will be the lead person helping with those orchestration? The Antichrist. And you know what's going to be interesting about this Antichrist? People are going to love him. They're going to think, this is the answer to our problems. This guy, he's got the knowledge. He's got the ability. He's got the understanding. And one of those things, according to Daniel chapter 9 and other passages of Scripture we go to, he's going to make a pact with the nation of Israel to settle the peace agreements and people are just going to, to, to have Israel allow him to come do that and to see the peace that takes place now through all the nations. Speaks of two things. One, how bad will it be before that happens? But then secondly, the fact that he's doing that and these people love him is also going to be very concerning. Now listen, based on our study of the Bible and, and being a dispensational understanding of, of the end times, we won't be here for this. We may have an idea of what's coming, but we're not going to be here for this as a Christian. But you need to understand this, is that when it happens, for about three and a half years, there'll be relative peace. There'll be a lining of nations and whatnot, but at the three and a half year mark, the Bible tells us that the Antichrist will turn on the people, and nations will start fighting again, and he will uh, turn into a leader of war and start just wreaking havoc. And there'll be great turmoil on this earth, and that's when many of the woes start being unleashed here on this earth. So, That's just an understanding of of where this will go someday. So John is saying, that is not coming yet. It's still in the future, but John actually thought it could be any day that's going to take place. So he was was living as as the Apostle Paul and Peter, like, folks, any time Jesus could return, that's why serve him now while you can. And now 2,000 years later, we're like, yeah, Jesus is going to come back someday. I mean, whenever. 
We don't live with the same anticipation. We don't live with the same desire to see people saved because tomorrow we may not be here. But that's the way the Bible says it. It's any time. And for 2,000 plus years, it's been any time. But we don't live with that passion. We live for the now. Shame on us. Because if we really understood the Bible, we'd be living right now like today's the last day. Who can I talk to about our crowds? Who can, I, who can I get to come to church with me and hear the gospel? Who are my friends, my coworkers, my family? They need to hear this message because we're just not promised tomorrow. We keep thinking we are, but we're not. And so this distinct warning was about the present time. We are in the last time, but it's not the very end of time. And so these antichrists, we see there's going to be one antichrist who will be influenced by Satan. Uh, may I make a statement about this too, that this antichrist is not going to be Satan himself, but it's going to be influenced by Satan. Whether he's possessed or controlled, he will be doing Satan's, Satan's bidding. But I want you to also notice this, that this day of the Lord is something referenced. Turn back with me to 2 Thessalonians. By the way, the first point is my longest point, and then we kind of hurry through the next couple, so don't be too scared about the time. Say, oh no, I know you, Pastor, I'm still scared. All right. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, beginning in verse number 2, and verse number 2 is a reference point because here the Apostle Paul is writing to Thessalonians, they're, they're scared and concerned, they're going through persecution, they're wondering what's happened to their loved ones. No doubt when you go through persecution, just like the Ukrainian believers over there, how easy would it be for them to think, is this the last times? And if you study the Bible without really understanding the, the time frame, you'll think, man, maybe this is it, maybe God's coming back now. He's not. Now, He could, but that's not a scriptural reference at this particular point, but you're going to understand that's what these people were going through, these early Christians that were going through persecution, so it made them question, is God coming back? We're going through this persecution. Where are my relatives that have died in the faith? So he's telling them here in verse number two that um, he says, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. In other words, he's saying that this day he's talking about here is talking about that apocalyptic event. He said, that's not at hand right now. He's saying that's not what's going on. And so he's trying to calm them by saying it's not right now what the day of the Lord. That's another prophetic term about a future event, a cataclysmic event that will take place. He's saying that's not what's going on right now. And so he then clarifies what is going on. Verse number 3. He says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. That falling away first is, is the, uh, the word, the term behind it is uh, apostate. Uh, and so, and then it goes on to say that the man of sin be revealed, that the son of perdition and the son of perdition, excuse me, perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. All right, some of you are just like, okay, Pastor, I have no idea where you're at. Those of you that know some of the end times, this is a reference to the tribulation period, the three and a half year mark, where Satan, the Antichrist, after the rebuilding of the new temple, just think about that. There's a new temple in Jerusalem built, and the Antichrist goes into this temple and commits apostasy by going inside there and sitting on the throne. And this is what it's in reference to. We have Daniel 9, we have uh, Revelation 6, we have uh, Revelation uh, maybe 19. There's so many other references to this, and you have to understand, this is a huge transition in the scope of end times. Again, what he's saying here, this is not that time, that time will come. He's trying to comfort them. But he says, here's what's going to happen before that happens. Here's what needs to take place before that happens. So John is, is doing his job as a great teacher, trying to calm their nerves in one respect, but then also let them know, hey, but among you, there will be false teachers. There will be those who are anti-Christs because they teach against Christ. And so without going to a lot of different references, uh, that gives you kind of an idea. Uh, I won't take time, but Revelation chapter 6, uh, God will give Satan the ability to come back on a white horse. Now, there's two white horses in Revelation. Jesus is one riding a white horse, but then Satan, or uh, the, the white horse of, of war, uh, illustrated, most people believe that it will be Satan. God will give him permission during the tribulation period to bring war on this earth. 
And so white horses are typically associated with war and governing power. And so that's a reference uh, to the day of apostasy, the day that Satan corrupts the temple, corrupts uh, that, that treaty and everything, and goes against uh, the people. And so I want you to notice also back in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, he's called the man of sin or the man of lawlessness. And that's a reference uh, to uh, the Antichrist. So who is a true believer and who is not? And this is the question really that comes from our text. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 18. Little children, it is the last time. And ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. We just went through that. So there will be a day where a future Antichrist, one possessed or or influenced by Satan, will come. And that will be in the tribulation period, not our time. Even now are there many Antichrists. Now, this has been going on since Jesus' day and is continuing to go on right now. People who stand against the message of Jesus Christ. Whereby we know that we are in this last time. So, who is a true believer? is, is uh, a very good question, and who is not? Does a professed believer have the right view of man and the right view of Jesus Christ? Well, the right view of man from a true believer is that we are sinners in need of a Savior. The right view of Jesus Christ is He is a Savior who came to save sinners. That's the right view. That's the only view. He is God. He is the one that came on our behalf because we are incapable of paying for our own sin debt. God had to come and die on our behalf to offer to mankind sin. Uh, uh, payment for sins. And so that is the true message of God. And so who is deceived by Satan? Well, it'll be those who are deceived, those who do not trust in Christ and those who believe the false teachers that pull them away from following after Christ. And so that's important for us to to make sure we understand as well. Uh, Go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and notice in verse number 6, And now ye know that uh, what withholds uh, that he might be revealed in his time for the mystery of iniquity, that's the word lawlessness again there, doth already work, and only he who now lets will let. In other words, he who restrains uh, for a time until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked, that wicked be revealed, reference to uh, Satan, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And so we have a reference there then to right now, God is still restraining the full power of Satan from being at work. Part of that restraining is the Holy Spirit inside of all of us as Christians. Believe it or not, you are at work restraining the totality of sin and deprivation that could take place in this earth. Why? Because God's spirit's inside of you. But it is the Holy Spirit who is restraining, keeping Satan from doing what he would actually want to do in full. Notice verse 10. And with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. What are you saying there is many people will be deceived because they are unwilling to receive the truth about who Jesus Christ is that He truly is God, that He truly came to die in our place on the cross to offer mankind, mankind forgiveness of sins. Those who are going to follow the antichrists are those who reject the message of Christ. They actually are standing against the message of Christ themselves, but they would not call themselves an antichrist. Well, they were anti- against. So those that you presented the gospel to, they say, I don't want to hear it. That's antichrist. They're standing against Christ. They don't want to hear the message. I met many people like that through the age. And I still pray for them. Lord, please open their heart, open their mind. Why? Because the God of this world is blinding their minds to the truth according to the Scriptures. And the Spirit of God can open up that mind and and give them the understanding that they need. And so who is a true believer and who is not? Well, a true professed believer believes everything that is said about Jesus Christ. A, A false professor is one that can deny aspects of Jesus Christ. So we see there, first of all, the understanding that there is a distinct warning. And John gives them a distinct warning that they are in the last time. How do we know we're in the last time? Because there are many different people that stand against Jesus Christ. Do we not see that all the time in our culture? Absolutely. We see it many times. The second thing I want you to notice in verse number 19, that there is a delinquent origin. A delinquent origin. Forgive me for being so wordy here, uh, but... uh, 
Verse 19. Notice what he says here. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt, no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made known or manifest that they uh, were not all of us. What's he talking about? He's talking about the Antichrist. The people that at one time went to church with them. One time worshiped with them. One time maybe even made a profession of faith. Got baptized. Started attending church. Maybe even taught in their churches. He said, but eventually they went out from us. Why? Because they were not, we're not talking about people who move, all right? We're in a very transient community, all right? We're not talking about who just move. We're talking about people who quit on following Jesus Christ. Or they start teaching some deceptive uh, lesson that pulls people away from the truth of the gospel. He's saying they went out from us because they're not of us. And what happens in, in churches sometimes, and I've, I've seen this uh, only a couple times in the history of our church, if we had to call someone on the carpet for teaching something that we did not align up with our proper doctrine. They say, hey, we love you, but if you're going to continue holding to this belief, you are no longer allowed to be a teacher in our church. And so I remember years ago, uh, we were in the strip mall before we built this building, and, and I had a gentleman attend a church on a Sunday morning. He was in his late 50s, I think. And uh, he said, could I meet with you this week? And can we talk about some things? I said, absolutely. And then uh, when he showed up, he showed up with more people. I was like, uh-oh. I knew I was in trouble. Anytime you ask for a meeting personally and then you show up with more people, you know you're getting ready to get ganged up on. And uh, so sure enough, I brought him into the strip mall where we sat down and, and uh, what they were trying to do, and the, the other gentleman that was with or older gentleman, and uh, what they were trying to do is convince me based on Old Testament scriptures that Jesus Christ appeared again in Hartford in 1970-something. And not only that, but he's appearing in different cities at different times still to this day. And they went back, and they're, studying, they're showing me verses in the Old Testament, and I said, well, you gotta, one, we have a problem with this, because according to the Scriptures, there's going to be a time where Jesus comes back here, but we're actually going up first. And of course, we debated back and forth. It was really not a heated debate until I told them, listen, I'm done listening. <laughs> what you're teaching is false, and I do not want you to come to our church and try to influence anybody at our church you wouldn't do, yeah, I'm a shepherd of my flock. I have the right as a pastor to guard our people from false teaching. And I, I felt like that would have been very skeptical, uh, skeptical at, at, at most, but it would have been false teaching. And so I could go on and on about their teaching, but they were trying to pressure me to come to their groups and be a part of their meeting. And I, I say, absolutely not. I said, I do not want any part of this. This is absolutely false teaching. And they left kind of upset at me, but I just say, that's okay. <laughs> I'm good with God. <laughs> But you get that from time to time. And sometimes the, the, the nice thing is when people leave that have false teaching. The hard thing is when they stay. And you know that just they're sowing little seeds of discord here and there. They're having little group meetings. They're having people over the house and they're teaching something false. That's so dangerous because they can lead astray people that are not grounded in their faith. Fortunately, when those things have happened at our church and the church I was a part of in California, people actually had this, the Holy Spirit of God, which is the blessing, and saying, something's not right with what you're teaching. And they would come to somebody in the pastoral staff or come to someone else that had knowledge and say, uh, that guy's wrong. You need to understand. He is absolutely wrong what he's teaching, or she's wrong what she's teaching. You, you should not. You should need to bring that to someone else's attention. And when it has been, and we had the meetings, we realized they've bought into a lie. And so the question does come up, are they truly a follower of Jesus Christ if they can deny any aspect of Jesus Christ's deity? The answer to that from the Scripture is very clear, no. Well, wait a minute, they made a profession of faith, they got baptized, they were a member of the church, but a true follower of Jesus Christ won't teach against Jesus Christ. We need to get that in our heads. But that's why there's so many different Christian denominations out, denominations out there that get followings because People will just go there thinking, well, they're, they're a church, they're organized, they, they have doctrine, so of course they call themselves Christian. Boy, if you want to take time, just go through the doctrinal statements of churches, even our own community, that don't line up with the Bible, there's plenty. You must understand, folks, when you stand for Christ, it is very clear what He teaches, and we must be willing to stand for Him. So they had a delinquent origin. What was their delinquent origin? They went out from us because they never were really a part of us, meaning their profession was false. They were not true believers, and that's why they stayed for us a while, but because people called them on the carpet for what they were teaching, they had no room there to spread their false doctrine, so they had to leave us. Good, unless they have a change of heart, but then if they have a change of heart, you can be watching them for a while, wouldn't you? 
Yes, absolutely. Listen, folks, listen. Even as a pastor, your protection against false pastors is knowing the Bible for yourself and having the Holy Spirit of God. You hold me accountable. That's the beauty of the church. We're all in this thing together. And you should be able to know your Bible so well that if, that if I or anyone else came in here and started teaching a false doctrine, you would say, something's not true here. Something's not right. Uh, Pastor, we need to meet after the service. Maybe you misspoke, but we need to clarify this. And if I stood on something that was wrong, you have every right to call a meeting in church. Hey, he needs the answer for this. Amen. That's the accountability we have as a church body, right? Some of you are yes. Some of you are like, I have no idea. Okay. Yes, it's the beauty of the church being accountable to one another. If you were teaching something false, I would have the obligation to come to you or another brother or sister in Christ come to you. Hey, if you're going to keep teaching that, we're going to have to have a meeting with a few folks because that's not right. And you have the same thing to do with me. You have the same right because we're here to protect each other from false teaching. I'm not talking about little opinions here and there, right? Does Adam and Eve have belly buttons? I don't know, but I'm not going to you know, divide the church over it, okay? I had to get some of you back in here. All right. So they had a delinquent origin. What was their delinquent origin? They weren't saved to begin with. They liked the church. They liked being a part of a good people, but slowly they wanted to lead people astray. That was their delinquent origin. Second, uh, thirdly, definitive protection. And this is what I was kind of alluding to. Look at verse 20 and 21. I think this should encourage your hearts. Verse 20 and 21. But ye have an unction. The word unction there is also the same word anointing. It comes from the same word in the Greek, chrisma, which has the idea of anointing. It actually means to smear. You say, well, that's a weird. In the Old Testament, when the priests, when kings were anointed, where people were put into certain positions, they smeared oil on them as a sign that this person was uh, inaugurated or accepted to be a leader. And so that word smear there became the word anoint or unction. And so people were saying, we see God's hand in this person's life, and so we're going to anoint them for this particular position. And so that's what the idea was uh, behind that. And so we see that um, this wording John uses so, to help us to understand a, 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 an updated understanding of this, that in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit of God came upon people for a time and a purpose. In the New Testament, Jesus told us that he would depart and send a comforter, the Holy Spirit of God, and there would be a permanent indwelling of the Spirit of God inside true believers. This is good, folks. I'll tell you why this is good. You wonder why after you get saved that you have a sensitivity towards the things of God. You wonder why after you get saved, you start having a desire to read the Bible. You wonder why after you get saved, you, start, you have a desire to pray. You have a desire to be around other Christians. That's the Spirit of God confirming those things inside of you. Now, can you squelch that? Sure you can. But that's why it's so important to stay close to God. Because you don't want that to go away. You don't want to not sense the Spirit of God guiding you. But as you continue in sin, sure enough, you can squelch the Spirit of God for sure. But I want you to notice this, that this definitive protection, uh, I didn't finish reading verse number 19, or 20, so 20, 21. But ye have an unction, uh, an anointing, from the Holy One, and ye know all things. In other words, you have the ability to understand things that are taught to you. So if a false teacher comes in or a true teacher comes in, your spirit's bearing witness or saying something's not right there. So you have the ability to understand things that are being taught to you. Verse number 22, or 21. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. And so what he's saying is, hey, because you have the Spirit of God inside of you, you are the ones who can identify false teaching. How important is that for us as believers? Even if you don't have a copy of the Word of God, the Spirit of God guides you to know whether or not someone is speaking truth or not. That's the beauty of being a person who has the Spirit of God living inside of them. But you need to stay walking close to God where that sensitivity is there. And so that's, that's one of the blessings. And the last thing I want you to see is the deceptive teaching. Verse 22 and 23, the deceptive teaching. He says here that, Who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah? He is Antichrist, not the Antichrist, but he is anti, he is against Christ, he's in opposition to Christ, that denies the Father and the Son. Whosoever denies the Son, the same hath not the Father. 
but he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. So John is saying here, he said, they have a deceptive teaching, and their deceptive teaching pulls the hearts away of sometimes true believers who might try to go after new teaching, but definitely those who would be non-believers, that they could even believe a lie. And that's the danger of this. Uh, notice what it says here in verse number 26, 1 John 2, verse number 26. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. And John, no doubt, was talking about, in some cases, the Judaizers. Many of these people got saved out of Judaism, but they were being uh, persuaded to go back to Judaism, keep their Christianity, but come back to Judaism and have more of a works-based salvation. But John was writing also to confront the Gnostic teachings of the day that taught a different understanding of Christ. And so he was actually teaching them a, about a false Christ. And John was trying to warn them, don't be led astray by these false teachers. It's very dangerous they would follow after these false teachers. And so they, he, uh, obviously he's calling the Antichrist deceivers. These would be deceitful teachers among you. So you need to be careful. In our day and age, just as a, an example, I wonder sometimes as I consider, okay, what's to come after the Christians are raptured? Even before the Christian rapture, the Bible talks about a falling away, an apostatizing that's taking place already. Christians who once were Christians no longer attend church. Not talking about COVID, talking about they've just given up. Well, once they were like, boy, my family will always be in church. The church doors open, we'll be there. And they were growing and they were active and they were involved in their faith. And that has subsided. Then we also have people that I consider, what about when trials actually do come? What about when uh, the government makes laws against Christians gathering together. Uh, what's going to come to deceive the hearts and minds of people? And if you pay attention to anything today, you're already seeing it take place. And it's, it's been expediting over the last hundred years in our culture. One example I could give you is the media. The, there's a bill that was introduced in Florida, and only because this is actively right now just in the news, and I brought it up as one, way, one means of people being deceived. You might have heard it as the don't say gay bill, but if you understand that that's not what the bill is, the bill is called HB 1557, and the bill was actually formed by uh, the state of Florida in order to give parents the right to decide from kindergarten to third grade not to have instruction in sex education to the children. That was, that was the bill. And there's more details there, but it got picked up by activists, and if you've watched the news at all, you'll see it. They're out there with their flags, and they're, they're picketing information, and it's don't say gay. And they made this thing a whole attack against a majority of people. They were saying, no, we just don't want this pushed on our kids at that age. But you see how quickly it's, it's twisted. And if you go to work, if you talk to people in the world, they'll say, all oh, those people down there, they're so against these people. It has nothing to do with that per se, they were just trying to protect a certain age of kids not to be taught for something that the, the parents said, we have the right to tell our kids about this stuff. And I say, amen. I'll be the weirdo, okay? Yes, amen. You have the right to teach your kids what you think is right. And I give that as an illustration, just wondering how much more will come in our society that we just buy into that will just keep changing the, the cultural fabric of our society when we just believe whatever is told to us. Another illustration Science. Evolution is a, you fill it in. It's a theory. It is a lie. <laughs> it is a theory. The scientific method cannot prove evolution. This, you check the science, check the, check the articles. Now they claim, now, if you attend public school or college or whatever, it is spoken as truth. There's no debating it. There's no questioning it. It is spoken to truth. Even if it's not in some circles, talking about even secular, where they would say it's a theory, but you know, we teach it as a... In most people's minds, there is no questioning evolution. It is absolutely embedded in them. It's the truth. That's only happened in the last 90 years. And it just, but you see how quickly... Something that was once taught as a theory or was, was not even taught primarily, it was creation was taught before that, how quickly things can change in society. And I'm giving you these illustrations because what's going to happen with Christianity? 
What's going to happen with the belief system of our culture when we keep mixing in with the world, we keep mixing in with other religions, and we keep dumbing down the truth that Jesus wants us to hold to? Another illustration I give you is climate change. I sent this out to our our staff mentor group this past week, only because I read the book when I was younger, The Ship Endurance, Shackleton's Journey to the Antarctic. Some of you might be familiar with it. But just this past week or two, they showed picture of this 144-foot wooden ship at the bottom of the Antarctic Ocean. And the reporter, who has, uh, was a huge promoter of climate change issues, was going on and on about uh, one good thing about climate change, we were able to finally access this boat, all right, that's at the bottom of the ocean. And they showed how extensive research and all that took place to finally get to this location. And you know they showed to get to that location? Massive steel ships that had to break up the ice, and it took them years and years and years to finally able to get to this location. And I'm thinking as reporters talking about this, trying to promote climate change, I'm thinking, is she not thinking through this real well? A wooden boat got there over 100 years ago, and now we have to use icebreakers that took you years to be able to get to. Now, folks, whether climate change is real or not, we know things will be changing. But listen, over 100 years ago, a wooden boat was able to get to that location. Could it not be cyclical? That once in a while things flaw and then they, they, they get bigger somewhere. Yes, but once you buy into something and you're not willing to do the research yourself, you kind of just tout whatever people tell you. And I'm saying this as illustrations. These are current illustrations, but I'm saying that to you not to uh, thwart one thing or other, but you must understand these are ideas that are put out there, and as long as enough people pick them up, it becomes truth. Cigarettes. Now, we've seen in the last, what, 25, 30 years, the, the, the cigarettes have been dying off the scene, you know, for the most part. But you know, one of the biggest advertisement campaigns, who were the faces promoting cigarettes that launched them to a whole other level in the marketing area? Doctors. They had pictures on cartons with doctors talking about the benefits of smoking for your throat issues. Now, folks, Listen. Any common sense person would say, okay, I know a lie when I see it, okay, (laughs) or when you taste it. Now, come on. This is something that you see. I only say this because how easy will it be for us to deceive or be deceived if you don't know the truth? Now, listen, I'm talking about spiritual. This is just, this is earthly temporal stuff, but think about it. When the Holy Spirit of God is no longer at force here, How easy will it be for people to believe a lie spiritually? It's already happening. But you, if you have trusted Christ your Savior, have the Spirit of God inside of you. He is able to guide you to know truth in error. The more you study your Bible, the more you're going to be stronger in your faith. The more you attend a good gospel preaching church, the more you're going to be stronger in your faith. The more you connect with other Christians that can build up your faith, the stronger you're going to be. Why? Because he says, you are living in the last times. Be active about your faith. So what's the application? Question, are you a true believer? That's what he was getting to. False believers will follow after the antichrists. They'll, they'll follow after the false teaching that's out there. Do you believe in the deity of Jesus Christ, that He truly is God in every aspect of that? Because that was the big question in John's day. Gnostics were going against the deity of Jesus Christ, that He was truly God, 100% God in the flesh and spiritual. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is your personal Savior? Listen to Hebrews 10, 22 through 25, and I'm done. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. 
what the writer of Hebrews is doing is he was rallying Christians to say, hey, it's not over yet, but you should be more faithful because all the signs are lining up. We're in the end times, but the culmination is not here yet. But man, every day it's getting closer and closer and closer. Just be faithful to God and to make sure that you truly do know Christ as your Savior. Father, thank you once again for this time, and I thank you for the ability to just share these truths from the Scripture.